All right, guys, uh, how's it going? This is a new episode of Spartan Ownership, and uh, today it's one of those episodes where I bring in a guest to talk about their experience because I'm only 20, 21 years old, guys. All right, so <laughs> I don't have too much credibility when it comes to this kind of stuff. And uh, Mike Massey, he's been in the martial arts for years, if not decades. I, I believe it's decades. And uh, we're going to you know, talk a lot about uh, warrior virtues, uh, life experience, and just learn from his experience so that we can become better men. And uh, Mike, if you could just kind of talk a little bit about yourself uh, so for the audience. Sure thing, Max. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, so, uh, yeah, I uh, I have been in martial arts, involved in the martial arts since I was a, a young kid. Actually, I got interested in the martial arts when I was about seven or eight, a little younger than that. I, you know, it's a classic story. I was a dorky kid. You know, I was just a goof. Um, it's really smart. Incredibly smart for my age. Um, probably a little bit too smart for my own good. Uh, wore really thick glasses. I mean, if I could show you, <laughs> I should have. I wish I had them out for a props. So I could show you the, the glasses I used to wear. But I wore what they used to call Coke bottle bottom glasses in the military. We called them uh, birth control glasses. And uh, I was skinny, you know, and I got picked on a lot. You know, people picked on me because I had poor social skills. You know, the whole bit that goes along with, you know, being a really bright, quirky kid. So I got into martial arts and uh, started reading books because we were incredibly poor. Um, my mom was single and uh, she was Mexican American in uh, in near St. Louis in a small town near St. Louis uh, back in a time before NAFTA when you just didn't see Hispanics all over the place. You know, you didn't see Latinos and Hispanics everywhere. And so she had a very difficult time finding work, even though she was uh, had a degree from uh, Hardin Simmons University here in uh, Texas, which she had had to fight to get back in the day. You know. Uh, and uh, she was certified as a teacher in the state of Illinois. However, uh, she just couldn't get anybody to hire her because they just, you know, there was a lot of prejudice, a lot of racial prejudice back then. So we were extremely poor, couldn't afford martial arts lessons. So I would just get with a buddy of mine, Larry, in our garage and, you know, we would, you know, make nunchucks and stuff like that. So years later, um, through a custody battle for various reasons, my dad ended up getting custody for, of me and uh, he ended up putting me in martial arts classes. So I started doing martial arts uh, formally when I was about 13 years old, and I've been doing them ever since. So, you know, over three decades. I'm 45 now. Awesome. Yeah. So anyway, how does that, uh, how does that, what does that have to do with what I do for a living? Well, I ran martial arts schools for 20 years um, professionally. I started my first school when I was in my early 20s. I'd actually tried to start a couple of schools before then, but they were abortive attempts where I failed because I didn't understand business marketing. Um, but my first successful school I started when I was 23 and uh, ran that school for 10 years, sold it, started another school, ran that one for five years, sold it, and then ran another school for a few more years and ended up selling that one. But um, during that time after, and I was telling you earlier about this before we started the call, I uh, when I sold my first studio, the reason why I sold it was I was working 80 hours a week. Um, I was working out probably three hours a day between uh, training with my students and training on my own. And I got burned out. I burned myself out. I didn't understand, you know, um, you know, how to balance, you know, sleep and and rest along with training and so forth back then. So I ended up selling the school because I developed autoimmune issues and was sick all the time. Didn't know why. Sold it to a buddy of mine. And uh, after I sold the school, I went from working eighty hours a week to working hardly at all. And uh, you know, I started to get kind of bored and a little depressed because every day I'd drive by my school, and of course I had to go in there to help my buddy out, you know, to make sure that you know he was uh, the transition was going smoothly. And, uh, you know, it was kind of hard, you know, because I'm like, here's my baby. I'm looking at my baby and it's not my baby anymore. So, you know, what am I going to do? So instead of sitting around the house and feeling sorry for myself and getting depressed, I decided to channel it all into something positive. So I wrote a book, a business manual for martial arts school owners, and I called it Small Dojo Big Profits. But the funny thing about the, the manual itself is the place that I, that I was in where I wrote it um, was I was really pissed off at the industry. Uh, I had spent at that time 10 years as a professional in the industry and had uh, been around a lot of people, a lot of people who were considered to be um, leading consultants and uh, thought leaders in the industry at the time. And I was kind of pissed off at some of the stuff I saw. You know, I saw a lot of a lot of dissembling, a lot of encouraging people to do things that, um, you know, as, as far as, you know, being morally and ethically speaking, I guess, um, that just weren't on the up and up, you know, I, that I didn't agree with. And I was impacted by some of that as well. So I wrote the book from that perspective, and I was actually told um, by a guy not too long ago, was, well, this is a few years back, but he said, you know, you should really write that book, or rewrite it, because it's really angry. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, that was kind of the point. But um, that book led into a uh, consulting gig that I kind of fell backwards into. 
because I wrote the book, I finished it, and I was like, gosh, you know, now I got to get it published. And I realized because of the way I wrote the book and the things I said, um, probably wasn't going to get published. Besides, it was a little too niche. And uh, and then I also realized when I started looking at the publishing industry that um, the contracts that writers get are, you know, they're borderline slavery. I mean, you're getting anywhere from, you know, usually it's about 10% royalties is what the writer gets on sales of a book. And, and you know, after all the stuff you have to do as a writer to promote your own books, you're not making that much money. So I decided to market it myself. So I went out and I bought two books. I bought um, Dan Kennedy's Ultimate Sales Letter book. And then I bought um, the uh, copywriting handbook by Bob Bly, which is also excellent if you're into copywriting, sales copywriting. And uh, set up a website, wrote a sales letter, and started marketing the book. So it started selling, kind of became an underground sensation. Caught a lot of flack in the industry at the time because people said it was a McDojo book, McDojo manual. And people actually, it was, I, I, don't, I never really found out if this was something that was instigated by people in the industry that didn't like what I was saying. But there were people going on martial arts forums, internet forums, which were really big, you know, like 14 years ago. <laughs> you know, you didn't have Facebook and stuff. Yeah. Um, and they were just making up just bold faced lies about me, saying that they ordered the book, I stole their money, never sent it to them, whatnot. But, yeah, this is God's honest truth. But what ended up happening was is I became kind of, a, uh, kind of an underground personality in the martial arts industry because I was the first independent uh, person to come out, independent author, I guess you could say, school owner to come out and... and Tell people, hey, you know, you don't need billing companies, you don't need consulting companies, you don't need all this stuff, which is ironic because I'm doing consulting. But you don't need all this stuff to be successful in, in running a martial arts school. All you have to do is really is be honest. And the other thing I said was is that you don't have to have a huge school. You don't have to have 10,000 square feet. You don't have to have 300 or 400 students. And besides, if you have that many students, you know, how can you maintain quality in your school? So yeah, I just basically promoted people with a different approach to being financially successful and independent in the martial arts industry, and people liked it. So they came back and started asking me for advice, and after a while, I got tired of spending 20, 30 hours a week free answering, <laughs> answering questions for free. So uh, I started the consulting gig, and I've been doing it you know, part-time ever since. Hmm. So your full-time gig is something – is running the school? or? Well, you know, I, I told you earlier that I sold my last studio a couple of years back. Right, right. Um, I'm in talks with a buddy of mine. A friend of mine wants me to start a school with him. I, I, I have mixed um, emotions about doing partnerships, business partnerships. Um, they tend not to go very well. But anyway, yeah. I'm looking at possibly starting another studio. I'm not sure yet. But, uh, but right now I'm in between studios. So I do consulting work. And consulting is actually now, it's kind of my full-time gig. Oh, okay. But then I also write fiction. Of course, I write, I write books. I write nonfiction books as part of my consulting business, but then I also am a fiction author as well. So oh. between the two, I mean, you know, honestly, either one supports us, but, uh, but it actually, you know, together right. they do really well. Awesome. So yeah. it seems like you, um, you're one of the rare few that uh, managed to combine, I guess, uh, passion with, with business in a sense, because, you know, that's, would that be safe to say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. Before I started my first school, I was working. I'd worked a string of, of uh, minimum wage jobs. I was a high school dropout. Didn't have any college behind me. Well, I had I had some college hours, but really nothing significant. You know, I had no real job skills outside of I'd been in the army and I was trained as a medic and an EMT. So I had those job skills, but I was tired of working in the healthcare industry. So um, you know, I, I was just you know I would work these you know minimum wage, near minimum wage jobs, and uh, teach martial arts at night. And whenever my job schedule would interfere with doing martial arts. That was my first priority. So I would quit that job and then find, find another one. Right. And uh, a buddy of mine who ended up getting his black belt under me, he was already a black belt in another system and, and came to us and got his black belt. But anyway, um, he had founded his own software company with his wife. And so I was one of his first employees. He hired me probably out of compassion because he got tired of seeing his martial arts instructor, you know, like drive these beat up cars and not be able to pay his rent and stuff. And so one day, you know, we sat down after I was telling him about how I'd, I'd quit yet another job. And he looked at me and he said, Massey, you know what your problem is? And I thought, oh, boy, here it comes. He's going to chew me out because he's a little older than me. And he said, your problem is you need to be the guy in charge. It's like, if you're not the guy in charge, you're not going to be happy. And so that was probably the germination. That was the seed that was planted in my head that I needed to start my own business and be serious about it. So that kind of started the whole journey. And, you know, honestly, from the time I had been a kid, I never wanted to do anything else but martial arts. You know, I wanted to do something with the martial arts. I wanted to run a school. I wanted to teach. I wanted to do it full time. But yet, as I was growing up, later in my teen years and then after, uh, before and after, you know, I, I was in, you know, of college age in the service and whatnot, people always told me you can't make money doing it. You know, that people, you know, 
if you're in a martial arts school, you know, you're basically going to work a full-time job to support your hobby. And uh, I believe that. I believe that lie for years and years. And, and that's probably why I had a few abortive attempts to start martial arts schools before, because I would start it and then I would let people talk me out of it. You know, oh, you're sinking all your money into this business. You're never going to, you know, recoup your, uh, your investment, you know. Um, you're wasting your time with this. Why don't you just go to nursing school? Why don't you just, you know, become a physical therapist? You know, and yeah, you know, you hear all this stuff from your family and, and they say it, family and friends, and they say it because they love you or they say they love you. <laughs> but uh, really, you know, they say it's in your best interest. But really what they're, what they're doing is, is they're not happy with their own lives. They're not happy themselves. They're unhappy with what they're doing. And misery loves company. So they say that they're really trying to save you from being hurt or from being disappointed. But what it really amounts to is, is that um, they don't believe in themselves. So they're not going to believe in you either. And I finally realized this um, when I met a guy. His name was Joe. And he was a really nice guy. Um, I had moved to Austin, Texas because I was living in South Texas. And it's just a very economically depressed area down there. Um, there's not a lot of opportunity or hope. Um, you know, I was living in a town that's, that's, you know, in an area that's like, you know, anywhere between 40 and 50% indigent in the county, if that tells you anything. So between 40 and 50% of the people in that county are on uh, government aid. Um, so I, I moved to uh, Austin, Texas to work for my martial arts instructor's master instructor who was starting a new studio. And, uh, you know, he had an apartment above the studio, let me live there for free, and then I would work for him. Uh, the problem was is that the guy was ethically um, – we didn't see eye to eye ethically and morally. That that's you know I'll just put it that way. He started his school literally right across the street, right behind a well-established school in this town. So instead of going and yeah I know instead of finding a location that you know was his, kind of his own location, kind of his own turf, he started a school. I mean literally within fifty feet. His front door was probably you know fifty or hundred feet from the front door of the school there. Well, the guy in the school was named Joe, Joe Gillum, and really super nice guy. I went in there the first day to introduce myself because I thought, you know, here I am. I'm, you know, I'm a young guy, young 20, mid 20, or early 20s, I should say. And I'm thinking, wow, this is a really weird situation and there's a lot of tension here. So I'm going to go try to diffuse it. So I walk across the street and I bow in the front door and, and the guy walks up and I say, hey, you know, I'm, my name's Mike Massey and, uh, you know, I'm working for Saul, you know, the guy who owns the school across the street. And he gave me this look like, you know, that was just like, oh, my gosh, like shock. You know, what are you doing in my school? And kind of took a step back and started blading himself, you know, uh, like a martial arts does. Bladed stance where you kind of turn because you're ready for action. Right. I guess he thought I was going to challenge him to a fight in front of his students. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, 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 no. I, I'm just here to say hi and to introduce myself. You know, I just want to make sure we have a good relationship because I'm working across the street. And so, you know, I, I don't want there to be any friction. So all of a sudden he's like, okay, so this guy is, you know, <laughs> little did I know that, that the guy I was working for had been causing him all kinds of trouble and all kinds of grief. Joe and I ended up becoming friends, and Joe was the first guy I'd ever met who had a successful martial arts studio. Um, he shared, you know, his success with me as, as far as how he had achieved it. Had anywhere from 125 to 140 students year-round in a small footprint studio. And, uh, you know, then worked a, a part-time job, you know, in the mornings just kind of for extra income and whatnot. But uh, basically, school supported him, and he lived a very comfortable life, you know, with, with a small school, by the way. But to me, that was incredible success. So uh, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time talking with Joe, and he would kind of say, hey, you know, if you want to, you know, do this someday for a living, you know, these are the things you need to do. You know, you need to find a mentor. You need to do this. You need to do that. So he kind of started me in that path, and he was the first guy, the first person that really started building the belief in me or helping me build the belief that I could be successful financially teaching martial arts. And, and thank God. Um, I ended up breaking off uh, from the other guy, you know, I quit and uh, moved out and got my own place and he ended up, you know, that became a feud of its own, which is, you know, not even worth discussing. But, um, but Joe was really the guy that helped me kind of start on the path. And within a year from that time, um, I was uh, running my own studio. Hmm. Yeah. That's actually funny that you say that because um, I, I was working at this uh, MMA gym about a month ago, I think. I, and right next to it, uh, I'm talking not even like the store next to it. Some mm -hmm. guy freaking opened up a karate school, and I was like, "What?" Yeah, you know, I, I, I never even introduced myself to the guy because honestly, it's a mix of like just wanting to leave because you know it's nine o'clock at night and stuff, and I'm leaving. I'm closing up the school, but uh, I don't know. It just feels weird. Like, what, what kind yeah. of guy does that? You know. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just a really well, awkward situation. 
it's it's interesting because I, I, I years later, this is my last studio actually, and it's one of the reasons why I sold it. Uh, I had found the uh, perfect location in exactly the neighborhood that I wanted to move a school into. There wasn't really anything there, anybody that was doing what I wanted to do, which was um, you know kick, running a, a combination of kickboxing and boot camp fitness studio. And then I was also going to run some self defense programs on the side, just because that's always been an interest of mine. But I, I know that uh, you know unless you're doing uh, a program like Problem Guy or something, you're not. It's not a huge money maker. But I decided I was going to open up the studio. I found a perfect location, but there was a Taekwondo school across, you know, the other side of the of the center. So I I uh, spoke to the leasing agent who was, uh, you know, uh, showing me these spaces, and I said, "Hey, is this guy going to mind if I open up this, you know, kickboxing studio right across from him?" I'm like, "Our focus is fitness. It's not that, you know, it's not the same thing that what he's doing. He's doing traditional martial arts, but I don't want there to be any friction." Oh no, it's fine. It's fine. He, he only teaches kids, you know, and, and she assured me that that was all he did. And as long as I didn't teach children, it would be okay. So I inquired about this many times with both the leasing agent and also the property manager, the people I was signing the lease with. And they insured, assured me, I should say, that they spoke with the man and that everything was okay. Mm-hmm. I didn't think anything of it. You know, at the time, you know, I had a new baby. I was taking the baby around with me because my wife worked. You know, I stayed at home. So I would, you know, take my kid with me everywhere I went. He was like six months old. And I'm carrying him all over the place with me while I'm signing these leases, you know, and, and rehabbing the place, you know, painting it and whatnot to get it ready to open. And uh, one day the guy walks in because I just got a final on the front of the, on the, front of the school that said, you know, kickboxing, boot camps, fitness, the animal sign put up. And uh, this, little, this little short Korean guy walks in, and, and uh, he could tell he is pissed. I mean, completely pissed. And, you know, the, probably the only thing that kept us from getting into a fight was he came in and he started kind of raising his voice and yelling at me. And it upset my son, and my son started crying. So I had to pick him up, you know, to kind of comfort him. And I really thought I was going to have to fight this guy, you know, with my son, my son in my arms. Well, thankfully, I had diffused the situation. Come to find out, they hadn't told him anything. And uh, I should have, in retrospect, obviously, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. I should have talked to him immediately. I should have went and approached him. But, you know, I put my faith in, in the people that, uh, that I was dealing with, that they told me the truth. So that ended up being, uh, we had kind of a contentious relationship. You know, I, I would stop by every once in a while and say hi and just ask him if there's anything I could do to help him. And I and, uh, ended up not teaching self-defense classes in that location simply because I didn't want to compete with what he was doing. Right. Um, come to find out he had a pretty strong adult program. But um, that was one of the reasons why I sold the studio, and uh, because you know, simply because it was it was kind of a bad situation. It was profitable. Uh, we did well in that in that uh, in that center, but you know, I just didn't want the hassles. Hmm. So um, I can't really I can't really say I haven't fallen you know into the same situation myself. You know, out of I you know call it my own foolishness or or um, altruism or whatever in believing what people tell me. But yeah. So anyway, enough of that. <laughs> All right. Um... So yeah, this channel, you know, I I talk a lot about uh, instant gratification versus delayed gratification, and how in today's society we're extremely conditioned uh, mm-hmm. to be. Well, I keep hearing this phrase, which kind of sums it up. It's we're living in a microwave society, mm-hmm. so like yeah. people are always used to having what they want now, 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 and I fall into that so much, and I think it's partly because of the way I was raised, which was. You know, single mom, uh, she was always at work, and I always had babysitters. They never really took care of me. They just put me in front of a TV all day. <laughs> and uh, I grew up kind of passive, just gratifying myself with whatever source of entertainment I could. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I had some problems with pornography and stuff like that later on down the line. Um, a lot of guys struggle with that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, 60, there's a, yeah. there, I've read a, uh, I've read a, uh, not to interrupt you, but I've read a uh, statistic that said 60% of the men in the church the modern church struggle with that. Yeah. I mean, almost every friend I know uh, uses it. Uh, every friend I have uses it on a pretty regular basis. And yeah, It's uh, like a drug. It, it impacts your brain like a drug. It really does. And, mm-hmm. like, sometimes it, it, it hurts, you know, because I grew up around this shit, you know. And it, guys that are, like, in their 30s, 40s, they had magazines, which aren't the best, but they're not as freaking bad for you as this non- nonstop stream of novelty and instant gratification, which mm-hmm. conditions you even further. Instead of going out and developing yourself socially, developing yourself as a man, mm-hmm. you have an endless supply of virtual women in your basement, so you don't even have to change who you are mm-hmm. uh, you know, in order to, to get uh, a relationship. So th- we have instant gratification in terms of relationships. We have instant gratification in terms of uh, health. You know, People don't 
go out as much anymore. They kind of sit around all day and order, you know, they have 20 different restaurants on their phone. They could order any one they want. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, go straight to your door. It's full of grease, salt, and sugar. Um, then we have instant gratification in terms of wealth, uh, especially with like the welfare society and uh, also just people being lazy, including myself, you know, and our parents pay for us and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then we have instant grat- gratification in terms of happiness, you know, endless entertainment, endless uh, video games, endless novelty on YouTube. You could be surfing all day long. Um, and I've really, I used to be really bad in all those areas, like, you know, instant gratification in every area. And what I found is like, it provides a very superficial uh, feeling of contentment that quickly gets replaced with the need for more instant gratification. But mm-hmm. the underlying thing is that you're not changing as a man, you're not becoming stronger, you're not becoming more resilient, uh, you're not becoming more worthy of, you know, doing great things. And uh, it's sad. And a big part of that is like, this feminization of men, because you know, go back a hundred years or just look at the World War Two generation and we had guys all over the place signing up to go fight in Germany, you know, and these were young guys. I mean, I can't tell you all the times I've heard about uh, World War Two soldiers uh, having signed up when they were like 15 or 16 because they lied to the recruiter. You know, there used to be some really manly men around and some of them are still alive today and, you know, obviously there are some that are still being raised today. Uh, but for the most part, there's definitely a decline in in men uh, basically developing themselves and creating those kinds of virtues that will help them succeed in life and be strong. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> that's kind of why I took on, uh, started doing martial arts because it teaches you a lot, uh, especially if you stick with it. Because mm-hmm. most people, um, what I found even just working in the gym for a few months, most people go in the gym, they come in for like a week or two, maybe even a month, but then they quit. A lot of them don't don't really stay but the guys that do stay for a year for two three years you really start to see something in them it's like this they start to develop like tough skin and i think that that really does impact uh you know other areas in their life so the reason where i'm going with all this is uh what are your thoughts on basically instant gratification delayed gratification and you could basically start off by saying because you said you were in the military and what impact uh did that have on your development uh followed by all your years of martial arts, like, you know what I mean? How, do, how has that kind of changed your, your, your brain, you know, and how has that reprogrammed you a bit? Well, you know, I'll tell you, and I, I mentioned earlier about uh, my mother and how, you know, we were poor because single mom, she couldn't really find work. And uh, she ended up getting depressed because of that. You know, here she is, she's isolated, um, you know, living in a town where most people, um, look down, look down on us. I mean, you can see me, you know, I'm, I'm as white skinned as they come, but, uh, you know, people would treat us differently because they knew our mother was Mexican or Mexican American. And, uh, so, you know, she ended up, um, I, I guess she had anxiety issues. The doctor prescribed her, you know, uh, Xanax or, you know, some other drugs and, and, you know, she was an undiagnosed, um, diabetic and also undiagnosed bipolar disorder. So she ended up spending most of her time sleeping on the couch when she wasn't, you know, working, you know, the odd, you know, substitute teaching job or what have you. So we were, you know, fairly neglected. She was also very proud being traditional Mexican American and, and uh, would not accept for several years wouldn't get on the welfare system, which we probably wouldn't be better off being on. So, um, you know, I'm one of the few people I know, I, myself and my brothers, who really know what it's like to go hungry. You know, there would be times when, you know, not only was my mom sleeping and she, you know, she wouldn't cook, she wouldn't clean the house. Her house was a wreck. Um, there were always dishes. I mean, we'd have, you know, food, you know, in the, in the sink with, you know, in the trash with maggots in it for days at a time. You know, um, you know we'd be scrambling around at the end of the month in the, ca- in the cupboard, you know, looking for things to eat, you know, and, and uh, coming up with, you know, you know, things like... <laughs> you know, mustard on moldy bread, you know, that would be a meal, you know, or, you know, we'd find some old potatoes and, you know, and, and, you know, carve off all of the mold on it, you know, and all the green stuff growing on it. And then we'd figure out, you know, how to fry it up and just have like fried potatoes. And that would be a meal because that's all we had. And, uh, you know, after a couple of years, my mom did get on welfare, went on food stamps and so forth. But, you know, I always felt like that was, you know, something that, uh, that was embarrassing, an embarrassment to us, you know, and then being the fact that, you know, not only are, you know, we, half the time we didn't have running water or electricity or heat, you know, in the wintertime, you know, we, we would have, uh, we'd have to, you know, shut off 
you know, two rooms of the house put a, with a kerosene heater to keep us warm in the winter. Um, we would have to go to the next door neighbor's house and get buckets of water to bathe. You know, we'd go over there with a bucket, fill it up, bring it back over, and then throw it in the tub and do that five or six times, and that's how we took baths. Wow. But, you know, when, you, when you're the kid who doesn't have new clothes, who's also, you know, you're kind of the stinky kid in school, and you're also a dork and a nerd, and you don't have any men around, like what you said, similar to the way you grew up, um, you develop some insecurities. So as I got older, and after my dad got custody of me, I lived with my dad. But you know, my dad wasn't really—he didn't really know how to father. He didn't—he he, was—he was a good provider, and uh, you know, a very—I'd um, say he had his—he—he he has his own um, code of honor that is very important to him. You know, he was a veteran and hardworking guy all his life, and believed in you know, you carry your own water, you pull your own weight, basically that type of guy. You know, old school, um, but you know, not not very good at fathering. And uh, probably because his father had been really distant and, and uh, you know, I, I don't think my dad ever experienced what it was like to, to you know, be, you know, to have a, a, a man who was both uh, manly and yet, you know, loving and, uh, you know, vulnerable in a sense around. So I felt very distant from my, my father, I, you know, and, and had some other issues there and ended up um, kind of, you know, clashing with him quite a bit. So he kicked me out more or less when I was 17 and I ended up on my own. And all those problems, you know, uh, they didn't they didn't get better when I left my home. They intensified. So when I entered the military, I actually entered the military in an effort to um, kind of get my dad's attention and then also his approval. But it probably wasn't the best place for me because I entered when I was seventeen. Um, I was very immature, emotionally immature, and I you know I stayed in trouble constantly the whole time I was in the military. I started off going in the guard. Uh, went to basic training, barely made it out of basic training because, you know, I just didn't want to be there. Uh, it was, you know, it, it was just ridiculous how immature I was. Came home and, uh, you know, wouldn't show up to guard drill, you know. So then they were like, well, you know, if you don't show up and drill, you know, we're going to kick you out. Um, so then I, I ended up, you know, moving to Texas and, uh, and you know, talked to a recruiter down there and got back into the guard in Texas um, had matured a little bit, then I went to advanced individual training, and that's where I really found myself was at AIT. Um, I went to AIT, became a medic, and uh, you know, committed myself to really listening to what the instructors had to say and to becoming the best soldier and the best medic I could be. And I, I did. I excelled. I graduated you know, toward the top of my class, got out, and then I volunteered for active duty during Desert Storm. And uh, while I was on active duty during Desert Storm, it was only for a short time. But I got to work for the three corps surgeon, um, worked for directly for a command sergeant, or sergeant major at the time. He later became command sergeant major and, uh, you know, fairly distinguished myself during that time on active duty. Um, so the thing is, is that even though I was excelling in my job and what I was doing, I still had all those issues. I had issues with um, having poor social skills, uh, being um, insecure about uh, a, a variety of things. Um, anger issues, you know, I was angry all the time. You know, I like to drink, I drank heavily. You know, I would, if, I would not pick up a bottle unless I was gonna get drunk. Um, I and mean, I was kind of a mean drunk too. That stuff led to my getting in trouble, um, both for mouthing off to people I shouldn't have mouthed off to. I mouthed off to um, a command sergeant major when I was on a, a, a special assignment. Uh, I went to Germany to reforge. I was a, their medic for basically for the the command battalion. And uh, what had happened was is one of my uh, one of my soldiers, you know, that I was taking care of had come in on sick call, and she had uh, what I believe to be an ectopic pregnancy, which is where the uh, the uh, uh, fertilized egg gets caught in the fallopian tube, and it can be life threatening. Right. Well, a couple of guys had taken my video, my not my video, my vehicle. They'd taken my vehicle that was my uh, medevac vehicle into town to get beer, and I was pissed. So I was looking for a vehicle to try to you know take this girl to the hospital, and uh, ran into command sergeant major and and failed to recognize him. So he locked me up. He was like, "What the hell is your problem?" I said, "Well, it's command sergeant major," and I explained the situation. <clears throat> he should have he should have like you know probably chewed me out. You know, um, yeah, get, you know I should have been in major trouble. But instead, what they found out was is the girl was really sick. And I potentially saved her life by getting her medevac. So I ended up getting a commendation for it. <laughs> that was nice. probably not the best thing that they could have done for me. Because what that did was is it reinforced my belief that I was special and that, uh, and that I could do whatever I wanted to and not get in trouble because I was so good at what I did and so smart and whatnot. Um, I ended up doing the same thing, pulling the same thing when I got transferred to another unit with my first sergeant. And that was the beginning of the end for me. 
Um, what ended up happening was, is I pissed this guy off so bad, um, and I had other things going on. I was financially irresponsible, and you know, getting into fights with people that I was rooming with in the barracks, and you know, all kinds of crazy shit that I was doing. Um, he brought me into his office one day, and he was like, "Look, Massey, I'm going to tell you, I don't like you. I think you're a shitbird." And, uh, you know, two things, one of two things are going to happen. Either you're going to let me send you home early on an honorable discharge, or I'm going to make sure you get a dishonorable discharge. And I said, well, first sergeant, I'll take the honorable discharge. And it's funny because I called up the command sergeant major that I used to work for, Sergeant Major Samples. And uh, he was um, he was the command sergeant major at that time of uh, first medevac. that was, you know, right there across the way from three Corps and Fort Hood. And I said, you know, Sergeant Major Samples, I, I, I don't know what to do. Because, you know, I've gotten myself in all this trouble and, uh, you know, I really want to stay in the military. I want to make it, you know, I, I like to make a career out of it. Um, but also, you know, you know, I, I'm worried that if I don't take this opportunity to go home right now that, you know, that they're really going to railroad me. He said, well, Massey, you got two choices. He said, I can get you transferred over to my unit, but I can tell you that, you know, you're going to have to straighten your shit out because I'm not going to put up with that crap in my unit. He said, I'll get you transferred over here and give you a second chance. But, you know, are you willing to step up and take it? Or you could just let him send you home. And I thought about it for a long time, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to let him send me home. So I went home, and and uh, you know, to a uh, uh, you know, basically to a depressed economic area. I had no job skills, had no job lined up when I got home, and I, I was you know basically living on welfare again. Had to get food stamps. I was living in a in a travel trailer and so forth. What I found through all those experiences was number one, because I was so focused on myself, and I was so focused on what you say is instant gratification. I just wanted what was best for me right now. I didn't care how my, my decisions impacted anybody else. If I wanted to go out and get drunk, I didn't have the money, you know, I'd just go get a payday loan, you know, and, and, you know, the hell with it. If I couldn't pay it off, you know, no big deal. Because I see, I hadn't developed my own um, ethical and moral structure. I didn't have a strong moral compass. I'd grown up in a, in a, uh, in environments where if you wanted to get ahead, um, it didn't matter what you did or how you did it. You would, you know, cheat, lie, steal, whatever, scramble over anybody else, knock anybody else off their rung of the ladder to get what you wanted because that was just the way everybody was. You know, they were going to stab you in the back, so you had to stab them in the back. That was what I'd learned. And uh, because I was so self-centered and, and so morally deficient, you know, I found myself in a position where I had uh, basically thrown away everything, every opportunity that I had at that, at that point. You know, I had an opportunity to be in the military to get education, to get training, to do all these things. Uh, I had to give up my GI Bill when I went home. You know, even though I got an honorable discharge, you know, and, you know, I volunteered for active duty during war. You know, I, I volunteered with the best of intentions. And, you know, there are, I won't say there's not a lot of people that do that, but that's something I am proud of. But yet my own personal decisions and my self-centeredness and that want for instant gratification, you know, I wanted to either, you know, get drunk, work out, or have sex. Those were the only three priorities I had. And that, those priorities, I listed those priorities ahead of my responsibilities to my unit and to the United States Army, and it ended up working to my detriment. So here I am, I'm living in South Texas, um, living in basically a, a uh, not even, it wasn't even, a, you know, it was like a, like a travel trailer, like a, like, a, like a camper. I'm living in a camper behind somebody's house, I have no job, I'm living on food stamps, uh, I have no transportation, I had a motorcycle, it, it was broken down, I couldn't afford to get it fixed. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, how in the hell did I get here? So it caused me to do a lot of soul searching and a lot of introspection. And I realized, you know what? You got here because you're, you know, basically a dumbass. You know, there's a, it really for men, there are only two rules in life. Don't be a dick. Don't be a pussy. That's it. I mean, it, it, you know, honestly, you know, for manhood, that's really what it all boils down to. Don't be a dick to other people, you know, and, and you know, don't be a wimp. And a lot of that, you know, it's not just physical toughness that we have to think about and making ourselves uncomfortable or being willing to be uncomfortable. But it also has to do with, you know, not taking the easy road. And for me, I was always taking the easy road. It was always like, you know, what, what do I want right now? You know, instead of delaying gratification and looking ahead to future goals and things that I wanted to accomplish and go, okay, I can't have this right now because if I do this right now, it's going to cause me to have to sacrifice something bigger and greater in the future. And I think a lot of men that have grown up without having strong fathers around, I think that affects them deeply because if you've never had that, that example for you of somebody who, you know, sacrificed, who sacrifices, you know, to protect and take care of their family and their loved ones, you know, 
I mean, I don't think there's anything more noble than the guy that goes into work every single day and works a job he hates, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, you know, and, and you know, grinds himself down every single day just because he's got a family to support and mouths to feed at home. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. Did the military help me develop kind of a more of a warrior attitude? In a sense, but it was really, it had to do with my own, <laughs> you know, uh, my own mistakes and uh, having that experience of kind of screwing up you know, my own plans and, uh, and, you know, disappointing a lot of people. And that's what led me to, um, like I said, a lot of introspection and starting to develop a, a, a moral code, if you will, kind of an honor code and saying, okay, I've got to have higher standards for myself if I want to get the things I want out of life. Right. Awesome. And, uh, that kind of reminds me, <clears throat> I, I grew up wanting to be in the military, uh, for a very long time. And cause like my best friend wanted to be in the military. Um, his dad was sort of like, he kind of took me around sometimes, you know, when I'd hang out with him. And he basically was there for me when my real dad wasn't. So, and he was in the military. He was a, a veteran. Um, so I grew up really wanting to be in the military for a long time. And I figured, you know, after school's done, that's it. I'm just going to jump into it. But then I started reading up on some some like some books some articles some started talking to people and uh i basically started kind of mistrusting the government like a lot of people these days do mm. um now my views have changed a little bit but uh but basically i ended up saying you know what i don't know if i want to do this or not because uh i i just didn't try i wasn't sure that the military was doing it for the right reasons, I guess, you know what they were doing. So I ended up telling myself, all right, I'm not going to do it. Um, but then I'm like, fuck, you know, like, how am I going to develop myself otherwise? Because there's no other real place that came to mind mm -hmm. that I can learn masculine virtues in such a intense fashion. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people will tell you like, yeah, it'd be, you know, these days being a man is such an, such a vague definition. You know, a lot of people could just say, oh, being a man is, you know, being open and vulnerable with your feelings, but it's like, and I swear there, there, there's a lot of people that think that, that being a man is just a social construct and that there's no inherent biological instinct to be a man. And, mm -hmm. uh, so it's just very ambiguous, very vague and confusing. If you're a, a guy growing up today with no real role models, mm -hmm. because everywhere you look, there's different messages. I mean, you see the, the, the movie with, you know, uh, it's that actor uh, from San Andreas, the, you know, the, the rock or, you know, all these like tough guy actors, basically. These yeah, I know who you're talking about. Okay. So the, the rock. Yeah. yeah. Dwayne, Dwayne Johnson, I believe. Yeah. There we go. Like guys like him, you see these movies with him and you're like, oh, that's a man. And then you see a movie with, or you see some show like, uh, you know, Big Bang Theory with where all the men are like wimpy, nerdy types. Yeah. And I then, love that show, but yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah. Right. And then you see Seinfeld where all the guys are just you know, chasing pussy. And it's like, who is the guy, you know, like, who do I follow? And, uh, I guess what a lot of guys end up doing is maybe nitpicking a little bit here and there, but at the end of the day, I, th I don't think that that provides an intense enough experience in terms of, uh, you know, helping guys understand what being a man is all about. So I was like, if I can't do the military, what do I do? And that's been on my mind a lot recently, especially, because I'm 21, so I could still kind of join the military and get out in time to, you know, do stuff. And uh, But then I just figured, all right, I'm going to choose to stay home. But how do I create this warrior lifestyle where I can truly grow as a man and really be mentally, emotionally, and physically tough? Um, but, you know, not to the point where I'm some weird, like you said, uh, don't be a dick about it. Um, and I really like those rules, by the way. I'm definitely going to remember those. And... Uh, so I'm, I'm like, how do I develop a lifestyle that helps instill these virtues in, in myself? And one of the, that's one of the reasons why I started doing martial arts, because if you go do martial arts a few times a week, you're definitely developing uh, a skill set that is mental and physical um, and definitely correlates with being a man in, in the traditional sense. Um, but then I, I was going to ask you, uh, how else do you feel like men today who don't choose the military as their intense route to manhood uh how else do you think or what are a few tips and tricks or maybe lifestyle ways of living that men can basically create a high degree of just you know 
manly and warrior type virtues. <clears throat> well, yeah, I have to say because you know that's that's a lot to think about. So let's unpack that. Sure. Okay. So so first we have to um, we have to challenge the idea. I don't have to challenge it, but we just have to examine the idea that that uh, you know the military is the place to develop man like or manly virtues. And that's not necessarily true all the time. I can tell you that uh, the units that I was in when I was in the military, you know, um, um, you know, I, I mostly worked an office job. And the first unit I was in when I was active, on active duty, it was a very cush job. I actually kind of felt guilty about it. You know, I volunteered to to go to a wartime theater, and you know, all these guys are over there in the sand, and I'm sitting in air conditioning. You know, um, you know, basically thumbing through TPS reports in a sense. You know, so so um, you know, the next unit I was in, you know, it was. Uh, uh, it was a unit that was, you know, kind of, you know, honestly, this was back in the in the '90s, the early '90s. But the the unit, in a way, was um, it was heavily um, influenced by the uh, the uh, feminism. Okay, you know, feminism was starting to creep into the military and into uh, kind of the standards, and then also, uh, you know, a lot of policy in the military. So we ended up. We had a female company commander who, um, you know, when she came in, you know, she was basically trying to, uh, um, you know, I guess she established herself as being a real ball breaker. And uh, and then I had, you know, a female in my chain of command, my immediate chain of command who, you know, just was, you know, I mean, really, she was tough. She was just one tough cookie. But um, what was interesting was a lot of soldiers at the time that I was in that unit felt as though there were double standards between men and women in the military. Um, you know, there, we had one soldier, for instance, that, uh, had gone off to Iraq and, uh, had gotten into, had had an affair while he was over there. Well, his wife was cheating on him. He found out she was cheating on him. So he ended up sleeping with another soldier who was over there. When he came back, his wife, you know, which he was trying to get divorced from her, she attacked him with a straight razor and sliced him from here all the way across his face. This wow. guy was a really good looking guy. He was a real playboy to tell you honestly, he was a really cool guy, really nice. Um, he ended up getting in trouble for it. Nothing happened to her. Happened on post, you know, the MPs came, um, you know, and, and because of the way that the system worked, um, nothing happened to her, you know, no, no charges, you know, no jail time, nothing. Uh, this guy had this huge scar across his face and, and uh, had his career ruined. He got busted uh, from uh, being an NCO to, to back to enlisted ranks. So I'm not, I'm not saying the military, you can't find that. Um, most of the guys I know who have, you know, gone in the military, they ended up in, you know, like in the Army and 82nd Airborne. They end up in uh, 10th Mountain Rangers Division, any infantry division, you know. Um, you're going to find that kind of camaraderie in that culture of masculinity, manhood, and, and, uh, and so forth. But in a lot of units, you won't. So it's 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 I won't say that the the military is the be all end all to develop those places. It is a place where you can seek that out and you can find it, but it's not it's not the be all end all place, and it's not the only place. Um, for a person who decides that the military is not their route, which probably you know, knowing now my psychological makeup after having done a lot of soul searching, you know, going through a lot of counseling and a lot of therapy to deal with my childhood issues of abuse, neglect, and so forth, and then also. Um, Doing things like taking Myers Briggs personality tests and understanding, you know, the way my personality works, I understand now that the military probably wasn't the best place for me. You know, I, I you know, I'm too much of an independent thinker and, and, and honestly, too much of a smartass. That's a lot of what got me in trouble too. Um, and I, I just couldn't stuff that down. I didn't have the social skills and the wherewithal to stuff that down at the time. Um, you know, martial arts training was the best place for me because in the martial arts. Uh, you know, depending on where you train, because you can obviously train at some schools where, you know, you show up, you pay your tuition, and you get a black belt. But in the places that I sought out, I was always kind of seeking out the hardest place I could train at. Um, you know, it, it really is kind of, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, trial by fire type thing where you're, you know, for example, you know, I worked out with a guy who was a world champion kickboxer when I was 17 and trained with him very intensely for a while. And, you know, I would go in there and, you know, this guy was grooming me to um, to enter a kickboxing competition. You know, he really liked me and took me under his wing. You know, I'd go in there at like 1.30 in the afternoon and we'd train for two hours straight. And here I was, I'm a 17-year-old kid and I'm in the ring sparring with this guy who's a world champion kickboxer, undefeated. And, you know, that guy, man, he would, you know, he would just work me so hard. He'd make me run up his back steps to his back deck up and down with like a big log on my back, you know. And this was at the end of our workout. This is the last thing we did. 
he'd make me run every day. And if I didn't run, if my time wasn't faster, I'd run two miles. It didn't matter if there was snow. This is in Denver, Colorado, you know, whatever. If my time wasn't faster than the day before, then I had to do extra push-ups, extra crunches, you know. I mean, you know, I'd have to get in the ring and spar with him every day. And, you know, obviously he was taking it easy on me. But I can remember, you know, I mean, there he kicked me one time so hard in the head. And I think it was an accident. But it, like, turned the face cage sideways to where all of a sudden I'm looking out the ear. You know, I'm kind of, you know, dazed and, and confused. And, and, you know, it was just kind of funny. It was just the training. You know, the guy I trained with in the military, you know, he was an ex-Green Beret, uh, you know, a uh, special forces and so forth. And, you know, he'd obviously found that in the military. Um, the training we did with him, you know, his training was, you know, it was brutal. You know, we worked out in this little racquetball court in one of the, uh, in, in one of the gyms there on Fort Hood. And, uh, you know, in the summertime, there's no heat, no air conditioning, you know. Well, there was heat, but there was no air conditioning. And in the summertime, man, it was just like it was so freaking incredibly hot in there. You get, you know, 15, 20 people in there sweating and breathing. And, you know, you're ready to pass out at the end of the workout. So, so you can kind of find those experiences within the martial arts world where you're being put through this crucible of discomfort and pain and, uh, you know, having to question yourself every single day and, and practically every minute of your training, is this something that I really, truly want? Now, whether that is necessarily developing the, um, the qualities of manhood or whether it's developing the qualities of, of just being somebody who just doesn't quit, you know, somebody who's a hard charger and, and just doesn't quit, you know, that's, that's arguable. But I think that that's some place where you can find that. And I think a lot of people do find that in the martial arts these days. Um, I would say that manhood really um, developing yourself as a man and embracing masculinity for people that, um, for young men that have grown up without having a man around. It, it really starts with personal integrity and personal responsibility. Because without those two qualities and those two values, with those, those two values being important to you, being of the utmost importance, you can't really have any of the other qualities that, that, uh, that uh, are found in men who are, in my opinion, manly men or masculine men. To me, a masculine man is not, you know, because a lot of people, there's a lot, there are a lot of dispersions thrown on manhood these days with, you know, modern feminism and so forth. You know, I'm, a, I'm all about equality, but I'm about true equality. You know, let's not have this false dichotomy that says that um, if you possess any of the qualities of traditional qualities that are traditionally seen as, as being manly and, ma manly and masculine, um, that you're a dick. You know, that you're automatically a guy who, you know, uh, puts down women, you know, who uh, doesn't respect women and uh, who beats his wife. You know, I mean, it's, you know, there's this kind of false dichotomy there. Um, in, my, in my world and from what I've observed and the men that I looked up to in my life that I've looked up to and tried to model myself after, um, they were men who had integrity and that took personal responsibility. Um, that, you know, they basically said, you know, if I screw up, I screw up and it's on me. And, you know, also, you know, if they do something wrong, they wrong somebody, they attempt to fix it. Um, and, you know, who, who aren't always seeking the easy path, you know, the path of least resistance. They're guys that said, you know, I'm going to do the right thing, not the easy thing. You know, no matter if the right thing is the hardest thing that I have to do. I think that those two qualities are, are really um, what the foundations of manhood are, are really made of. Awesome. And I definitely agree because um, even... A while ago, like maybe two years ago, I got my first tattoo and only tattoo so far. Um, and it says 100% uh, responsible because I started understanding that in today's society, it's so easy to make excuses as to why you can't do this or why you can't do that or why you're a victim or whatever. So I told myself, that's it. I'm not going to blame anybody else anymore for anything that happens to me. I'm just going to take full responsibility. So I got it as a tattoo on my wrist here. Nice as a, just a reminder so I could always see it. And then the the second thing I got to definitely agree with is integrity. Man, that word has been on my mind recently a lot, uh, especially for like the past few months um, because I'm starting to realize how powerful that concept really is. Um, to me, integrity is about um, basically being congruent with your mindset and then doing – I think integrity, what it boils down to, is doing the right thing when no one's looking. And what you also said about, uh, you know, doing the right thing instead of the easy thing. Because mm -hmm. if you're here, you know, preaching warrior values, and uh, especially if you're a martial arts instructor or somebody of that stature, it's important to have a lot of integrity because you're supposed to be an example of strength and honor and all these other things. 
so it's important to have that standard for yourself. Um, so I definitely agree. And I got to say, though, integrity is difficult, um, at least for me, because it really involves doing everything you say you're going to do. Because if you don't, you're not having integrity. I mean, you're you're literally not doing what you talk about. You're not doing what you believe. And man, like today's society is really distracting. Like with like I said before, all the instant gratification, all the nonstop stimuli, it really does. It, I think it makes it tough to have a lot of integrity these days because you have so many different outlets for your energy. So if you say, you know what, I am going to be a man of my word. I'm going to wake up early and do this and that and this. You have twenty thousand things to distract you that to keep you from that goal. So, it's it's difficult, but I definitely agree that that does add a masculine and warrior type uh, quality to your life. And uh, I don't want to you know take up too much of your time here. I, we didn't even agree how much time we were going to take, so I'll, I'll end it off All with right. this last question here. Um, if I have you, time if you want to go longer. Oh, okay, good, cool. Um, so maybe I'll have like a, a second question. I was thinking about it as you were talking. Yeah. Um, the first one that comes to mind is about honor. Because mm -hmm. growing up around mostly women, it's really – there's not much honor when, it, when, when you look at women relationships. Like mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of emotional bonding. It's a lot of like uh, just talking and having fun and being social. Mm -hmm. But there's something missing from it that I always notice that <laughs> you see among other men. And I think that a big thing that's missing is the honor aspect. Because when you when you look at relationships between other men, there's this sort of – it's like measuring each other but not really. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like respect, status, a little bit of fear, um, reputation, uh, a certain way of acting that – makes other men respond to you in a certain way. And I, I was just reading this book to kind of elaborate a bit further. Uh, I was just reading this book called The Way of Men. And uh, it's by Jack Donovan. He he writes a lot about like masculinity. And he basically said there's two types of honor. There's reflexive honor and vertical honor. Mm -hmm. So reflexive honor is, is the kind of honor that says uh, no one attacks me with impunity. Meaning be known as the kind of guy that if anybody messes with you, you're going to stand up for yourself, right? And then there's vertical honor, which is when you have done something in the past or you have achieved something great and then other men automatically respect you because they know that guy right there, he's done this or that. So I grew up without understanding any of that. And when I'd be with other men, I would always feel insecure because I'm like, I thought this was all about social and, you know, just bonding emotionally. <laughs> but for them, they stand up for each other. They do this, they do that. So to you, uh, how do you feel like, like for instance, when it comes to physical confrontation, this was a huge thing decades ago. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's any virtue or value in physically confronting someone for honor reasons? Or do you think that uh, verbal communication should always be the route uh, when it comes to dealing with other men? Hang on a second. I'm going to grab something here. Let me see if I can find it. Sure. Okay, so... I, I got to disagree with Donovan. Um, I, I've read some of his stuff, and you know, I, I like some of what he has to say. But I think, in, in many cases, um, I, I think a lot of his philosophy is a bit self-centered. So what what Donovan is talking about, and what you're saying, what he's saying, he's not really talking about honor. He's talking about regard, the regard that you um, that other people have for you, and defending that regard. That's totally totally different. Um, it's funny. If you've never read it, you should read, and it's probably my bookshelf over there. You should read "Living the Martial Way" by Forrest Morgan. Um, no. It's a book that came out. Do you have it? No. Okay. So, so in that book, Forrest Morgan it talks about how when he was, I think he was like a fifth degree black belt in Taekwondo or Tungsudo or something like that. But he was at this training that was being done for you know like black belts and master instructors. Right. And uh, these people were talking about, you know, well, you have to have honor. This one particular person who's a high-level black belt. you got to have honor, and honor is very important, and it's a big part of what we do. So he raises his hand, and he says, well, you know, but what do you mean by honor? And he was basically asking for a definition, and this guy said, well, it's just honor, you know? You just yeah. have honor, and that's what it is. And the guy couldn't define it. He didn't really know. It was such a nebulous concept. He didn't even have a, a clue about how to, uh, how to, you know, really define it for anyone. 
And the thing is, is if you can't define the values that you have in a way that's that's meaningful and it's also agreed upon by other people, then you're not you're really building a house on sand. You know, it's not you, you're you're no matter how much you think you're developing a moral or an ethical uh, foundation or framework for your life that's going to stand, yeah. it's not going to stand because it's not solid. So this is a book that I wrote. It's Martial Arts Character Education Lessons for Children. And the reason why I wrote it for martial arts instructors, it's based on the program I did in my own martial arts schools. The reason why I wrote it was because so many of the martial artists I knew were just like that instructor that Forrest Morgan talks about in his book where they couldn't define the values of their teaching. Right. Martial arts always says we, you know, we teach discipline and honor and so forth. I'm going to get back to your question about physical confrontation. Sure. But um, for honor, you know, I went through and what I did was I said, okay, well, I'm going to take all these different concepts and I'm going to define them. And uh, you know, in in the book, I talk about honor. That's one of the things that uh, that I deal with uh, quite a bit. You know, there's different ones in here. I'm kind of flipping through because I want to give you the exact definition that I gave my students. If I can find it in here, shows you how long it's been since I flipped through this. Okay, so honor. This is the first thing I do with my kids when I'm teaching them. You know, I'm doing mat chants, whatever. My adult students. Honor is having a sense of right and truth. It's knowing right from wrong and doing what is right. That's honor. That's personal honor. And that's different from regard. Um, the problem with physical confrontation and, and using physical confrontation as a way to to resolve personal or interpersonal issues. Um, you know, I'm not saying that there's not a time and a place for that because, you know, there are some people that the only language they understand is violence. We understand that, you know, all you have to do is turn on the news to understand that. But, um, you know, you, when we, when I teach self-defense, when I do uh, self-defense training for people, um, one of the things that you have to teach people is you have to teach them the difference between, um, you have a, uh, you know, a social violence and then you have, uh, a criminal violence. Okay. So social violence is what happens when you go to a bar, you know, a guy's walking along, he bumps into you on purpose, or you actually bump into him and you, you actually spill his drink. And then, you know, he starts to, you know, what we used to say in, uh, in, in Missouri and Texas, he starts to bow up, you know, and wants to fight, right? And then all of a sudden you've got this pushing contest going on and it's basically, you know, it's like a public pissing contest, a dick measuring contest. And then before you know it, you're in a fight. There's never any virtue in uh, participating in, in those displays of, of uh, you know, whatever. I, I, don't, I won't even call it manhood. Just this, those displays of, of, uh, of, of cockiness, arrogance, whatever you want to call it. Um, because there's nothing to be gained from that. There's nothing that's being protected but the regard that you think other people have for you, which is, you know, shifting and changing all the time. You know, if you look at the world that we live in with social media, um, somebody can be a hero one day and they can be a villain the next. You can be loved by, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of followers one day on Facebook and, and Twitter and, and Instagram. And the next day, you know, um, you know, something could happen. You could say the wrong word. You could slip one time and say the wrong word that's not politically correct. Right. And all of a sudden you're vilified by, by millions. Right. So the regard other people have for you is completely unimportant. What matters is having the honor within you, having your own personal sense of honor, knowing right from wrong and doing what's right. And like you said, when people aren't watching and protecting that at all costs, mm -hmm. I'm just like every other guy. You know what I want to do every day? I want to sit around. I want to fuck off. I want to play video games. You know, look at some pictures of naked women online, you know, eat bad food and ignore my wife and kid. That's my tendency. That's what my, that's what my body, that's what my flesh wants to do. But if I allow myself to do that, you know, I, I'm basically living in direct opposition to my personal honor and personal integrity. And if I don't maintain that, if I don't maintain my honor and integrity in my relationships with other people and in my relationship with myself, you know, in, in, in my own personal life, in my internal life, what good am I? You know, people can take everything else away from you. I can tell you that for a fact. They can take away your, your money. They can take away your home, your cars. You can lose everything. You can be put in jail. They can take away your freedom. But what no one can take away from you is your personal honor. Mm. Only you can give that up. Only you can divest yourself of that. So I hope you see the difference that I'm making here between, you know, having, you know, protecting the regard other people have for you and actually protecting and uh, maintaining your own personal honor. Right. I see. And when you say like people can't take away your honor from you if they jail you or anything, 
I've heard that before and I've thought about that uh, and I couldn't really understand it clearly. So what you're saying is like let's say you get jailed for the wrong reason. Somebody blames you for a crime you didn't commit and now you're in jail but you can't give away your honor. So what that means is you can't give away your – like what do you mean? Can you elaborate a bit more on that? If you live in complete accordance with your own personal sense of honor and integrity with your beliefs – and I do have to say that I believe in absolutes, absolute truths. Um, so I believe in an absolute morality, an absolute morality that says that, you know, murder is wrong, rape is wrong, um, you know, uh, raping children or exploiting children is wrong, you know, all the things that everybody can pretty much agree on, right? Lying is wrong and so forth. If you live in perfect accordance with that and you're, you're convicted of a crime that you did not commit, Nobody has taken anything from you. They can jail you and they can take away your, your physical freedom, but you know, they can't take away your mental freedom, your emotional freedom that you have in, in knowing that you have lived in accordance with your morals and your beliefs and your convictions. Mm. They can't take that away from you. Nobody can take that away from you. And if that's the only thing you can truly maintain yourself regardless of, of circumstance, or regardless of, of uh, how you may have been, you know, if I can use the word victimized or wrong by other people, you know, that's an incredibly powerful thing. And the, here's the thing with that too, Max, is that when you know that you have maintained your personal integrity, that you've kept it pristine, and of course we all make mistakes, we all do stupid things, you know, we all slip. You know, you might say, you know, like for instance right now I'm trying to drop the 30 pounds that I gained when I switched from teaching martial arts every day to writing every day, right. you know, sitting on my ass in front of a desk, you know, writing, you know, 3,000, 5,000 words a day. So, you know, maybe you say, you know, I got to lose this 30 pounds and, you know, uh, I'm going to do this, you know, uh, exercise nutrition regime. You know, maybe you slip up one day, you know, you have a couple of beers or you do this or that. Everybody does those things. But I'm talking about the really big stuff. The small stuff counts because, you know, big habits are, are, are built on small decisions. But, um, but still, you know, when it, when it comes to the big stuff, you know, um, you know, did I lie to my wife today? Did I go out and, you know, and, and screw around with the secretary at work and then come home and lie to my wife about it? You know, um, did I, uh, did I, you know, embezzle money from work? You know, did I, uh, go out and, you know, kill somebody in, in a bar fight and then take off? Nobody saw it, you know, and, and, you know, now I'm living with that guilt. No. I mean, if you, if you maintain honor in those things, those most important things, and it might seem like a, a, a low bar, you know, for, for honor and integrity, but really, I mean, honestly, it, it, those are the things that matter, you know, how are you, how are you living with, uh, um, um, how are you living with and getting along with your, your fellow man, with the fellow people that, uh, you know, the, the people that you have relationships with constantly, um, you know, how is, how are your actions impacting them? And, uh, you know, if you're living with integrity in, in that, you know, to me, that's honor. Mm -hmm. I see. And speaking of relationships uh, with other men, because <clears throat> that's probably one of the biggest things I've struggled with and a lot of guys I know struggle with. And the reason why a lot of guys end up isolating themselves, too, uh, yep. is this problem they have with relationships with other men. And, you know, <laughs> you ever heard of the, the Mankind Project? No, I haven't. All right. I just wanted to mention this funny thing before I go on. Um, it's basically this uh, It's this project or group or organization they have all over the U.S. And it's it's all about like uh, – it's, it's like a men's group type thing and they have a lot of guys go to the group and like they do this uh, Native American type ritual or something in it. But basically it's a place where men can be vulnerable with other men and kind of bond with other men and stuff like that. But the thing is, a lot of it isn't based off of true masculine virtue, I'd say, but more on, you know, it, it was actually a reaction to feminism. When I did mm -hmm. more research, it was a reaction to feminism because men started seeing the feminist movement and they started going, wait a minute, what about us? Mm -hmm. So instead of seeing anything wrong with the feminist movement, they just said, no, oh, that's all good, but us, we've got to do a movement too. So they started this movement where you know, they basically said it's okay for men to be emotional and sensitive and stuff. And I agree it is to an extent. Okay. But the whole movement and this whole organization is just men being emotional and kind of sensitive. So I actually went to a, a group meeting. I went to one of these uh, meetups once and basically what I saw was men that were together for, they were doing this group for over a decade, but all of these guys were just 
all day long, like the whole group, all of them basically were crying about stuff. And <laughs> I'm serious. Like they were all crying and I was just sitting there like, hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and then they were giving each other like hugs and stuff. And I get the point of that. Like there's a time and place for it. There's totally some value in being honest and vulnerable with other guys. But that's not the message I feel would, that would be truly beneficial to men these days. I feel yeah. like it would be a mix of maybe – Allowing that to take place at times, but also uh, there's got to be other components to it. So that's what what I'm trying to get at here with the question is like when it comes to other uh, when it comes to relationships with other men, what do you think needs to transpire with other men? Like, do you feel like uh, when you meet a man uh, that might be a friend or a foe or whatever, like what? We'll go, what's the conversation in your mind about the, the type of relationship it needs to be? Because with women, it's different. When you meet a woman, you're like, how do I make her feel comfortable and safe to potentially take her home? Or if it's your you know girlfriend or wife or whatever, how do I make her uh, feel fulfilled within this relationship? How do I, uh, you know, how do I be strong for her to make her feel safe with me when we're going places? But with other men, what do you think are the conversations you kind of have to have in your head about the relationship? Yeah. Well, you know, you're right. I mean, with, with, uh, the relationships I have with, uh, with you know, like say for example my wife, you know, my relationship with her is, you know, what's on my mind constantly with my wife is, you know, how do I protect her? You know, how do I keep her safe? You know, those are, you know, and provide for her and for my child, you know, so it's basically provide and protect. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, that's another conversation. I think a lot of times men get caught up in that and playing that role and they forget that there's a whole lot of other needs that, that women have. And uh, you'll, you'll learn that now when you get married, but... <laughs> But, you know, as far as relationships with men go, you know, it's funny because I'm an introvert. I'm a natural introvert, always have been. I've trained myself to be an extrovert um, so I could teach martial arts, so I could run a martial arts school and, and do the things that I do, consulting work and so forth. But but I'm naturally an introvert. If I spend a lot of time, you know, if we have a family gathering and my wife has traditional Mexican-American family, um, you know, very wonderful people, uh, you know, but a huge extended family. So when we have, uh, you know, everybody over, say, for Christmas at Christmas time, you know, it might be, you know, we might have 20 people in the house, you know. Um, I can take about four hours with everyone, and then I'm like, man, i got to go, you know, I'll find a room, and I'll go lock myself in there and go read or take a nap because that's all I can handle. <clears throat> so I have to force myself to be around other men um, in, in, and to develop deep relationships with them. And it's hard. It's, it's difficult. It's a challenge. Um, you know, but what I'm – thinking of when I, you know, if I'm going to um, build a friendship, a relationship with a, a, another man, what I'm thinking of is, is I'm thinking is, you know, I'm going to have this guy's back. Is he the type of person, does he have the integrity to where he's always going to have my back? Can I count on this person? You know, in the past, I wasn't the type of person that people could count on. And then I have a reputation for being very flaky. This was when I was a young man. Um, had a reputation for being flaky and and you know somewhat disloyal and so forth. Not really loyal, disloyal in the sense that I would just stab people in the back, but that uh, I would save my own skin, you know, before I would stick up for somebody else. It was pretty shitty, you know. I was not I was not a very good person, and I had to develop, um, you know, that uh, that sense of honor integrity over time. And the reason why I developed it was to develop my school. So if I'm going to be friends with a dude. I want to make sure that that dude's going to have my back, you know. Um, the, and you know, guys always talk about the man code, but man, there really is a man code, you know. It's like, you know, if 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 your friend, and, and maybe this just goes along with just being friends, period. But you know, if your friend's in a in a sticky situation, you know, and he needs your help, you know, not only your, you know, if, if your friend calls you up and says, "Hey, man." You know, I, I, you know, I just killed someone. You know, not only do you go, okay, well, I'll be right there, but you show up with a shovel. You know, I mean, uh, that's, that's having your friends back. Okay. And I'm not saying, you know, I would break the law for somebody or anything like that. But what I'm saying is, is that, you know, you go the distance for, for, uh, for a friend, for a true friend and a true friend goes the distance for you. Right. So that's the first thing I'm thinking about. The second thing I'm thinking about is, is that, you know, is, you know, developing this relationship with this person is, is uh, cultivating this relationship. You know, is it going to make me a better man? You know, or is it going to bring me down? Because I can tell you guys that I've hung out with the past, especially in, in the martial arts world, and this is kind of sad, but, you know, for a while there, you know, I was, I was running with a group of guys and we were trained doing martial arts, going to seminars, doing all this crazy stuff. And it was like every seminar, either we had somebody in or, or we'd go visit somebody, it was like, okay, training day is over. What are we going to do? Well, there's a strip club right down the street. Let's go to the strip club, you know? And it's like, 
you know, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, you know, here we are, you know, we're going to these martial arts seminars, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and we're, you know, we're going out and we're, you know, getting drunk and, you know, going out and, and hanging out and you know, doing all this crazy shit. And I'm like, this, this has nothing to do with edifying myself as a person and making me a better martial artist. This is just irresponsibility. It's childish irresponsibility coming out. So I had to break off and break away from all those people. Say, I'm not going to do that shit anymore. You know, because it was hurting me and it was hurting my relationship with my wife. So that's the other thing that I'm going to look at. And then the third thing I'm going to look at is, is how practical is it for me to maintain this relationship? And see, that's where a lot of men fail. Is um, when friendship gets too hard or becomes too much work, and then they stop. Or they're like, you know what, I'm going to back off or, you know, whatever. Um, my good friend, uh, Jim Mahan, who is, uh, he's a, uh, gosh, he's retired from the infantry. Um, he was a uh, Army Ranger instructor, um, served uh, three tours in Iraq, um, actually got injured. He, you know, he has like titanium rods in his spine, still does jujitsu, still teaches martial arts. You know, he's really good about um, making sure that he maintains the connection with me because he knows that my tendency is to like back away or to, you know, even just like forget, just forget to be in contact with people. You know, I, I, I'm really bad about maintaining, you know, those relationships and connections. So, you know, if, you know, I, uh, I go Didi Mao on him, you know, and I'm not around for a while, you know, he'll text me or he'll call me up, say, hey, man, just call and check on you and stuff, you know. And he's kind of taught me to, to learn how to do those things myself to maintain a relationship. But, you know, the thing is, you were talking about guys stand, sitting around all day, you know, crying and shit like that. Yeah. You know, in, in these men's groups, I'm like, you know, I've experienced that before, you know, like uh, I, I went to a church men's group, you know, that was, that was uh, all about, you know, different things, recovery and so forth. And what it became was is just a bunch of men you know, sitting around, you know, complaining and, and bitching, you know, go, oh, well, my wife hates me, you know, and, and it, well, you know, your wife hates you because you cheated on her with six different women, you know, or, you know, I just, I can't stop, you know, doing this, looking at pornography, whatever, you know, and it's like, well, you know, um, you can stop, you're just refusing to stop, you know, because you like it, you like that more than you hate the pain of what it does to you. And so, um, you know, you got to ask yourself, it's like, you know, do you think that, uh, that like the Spartans or the guys who, you know, blazed a trail across the West or the Crusaders, do you think any of those guys sat around all day crying and giving each other hugs? You know, they didn't have time for that shit. They were doing awesome, epic shit. <laughs> you know, they could, now I'll tell you, um, you know, like with my friend Jim, I can tell Jim anything, you know, Jim can tell me anything, you know, we, you know, we can talk about just about anything, but we're not going to sit around and cry about it. You know, if I tell Jim something and I'm feeling a little bit too sorry for myself, you know, like, you know, maybe you just need to buck up, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you just need to, you know, like pull yourself up by the bootstraps and just quit bitching about it and just do what you got to do. Right. You know, that's, that's the way healthy male relationships work. That's the way healthy male relationships, um, you know, work to make you a better man. Awesome. I, I love that. And, uh, I gotta say, um, you know, growing up around women for the most part, has made me somewhat, uh, I guess, you know, I've said this before, emotional, um, sensitive and stuff like that. So when I was younger, there's nothing wrong with that. yeah, there's nothing wrong with it per se. Yeah. But the thing is when I would meet other guys, I would try to bond with them on like a very emotional kind of level. Like as in I'd meet a, a, a guy and I'd be like, you know, um, I'd start being very open and honest and vulnerable, which is good to an extent, but I wouldn't take into account all the other stuff that was going on, like what you were talking about. And, uh, but then I meet guys sometimes that are like considered tough guys or whatever. I have a few friends that were in the military, a few friends that were, that are veterans actually. And some of them, when you talk to them, you feel this, uh, just, you feel this masculine energy from them and you kind of want to be open and stuff like that. But for some reason it's like, you're sending out waves like from an antenna and it's not bouncing back right. So mm -hmm. then you tell yourself, oh, I got to kind of, what am I doing here? I can't be all sensitive with these kinds of people. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of put up this, you kind of have to show your masculine energy too. Mm -hmm. And then they'll respect it and understand. Yeah. It. yeah. You definitely have to get respect from people, you know? Um, yeah. I will say that um, some of the, some of the most masculine guys and the toughest guys I know are also some of the guys here, the, the, you know, what I would call, you know, what we'd call as guys, you know, that's, a, you know, the coolest guys. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would say not necessarily sensitive in the sense that, you know, they're like Woody Allen sensitive, you know. I mean, you know, 
Fuck Woody Allen, you know, he's a pedophile. Right. But, um, you know, I, I hate guys like that. But, uh, you know, just, just the guys who are that type, you know, who are basically they're, they're reflecting a, uh, an idea or an ideation of manhood that's based on pleasing other people and pleasing what's politically correct versus being who they really are. Um, but I've known a ton of guys who are just tough as nails. I mean, just freaking tough as nails. Guys who are like MMA fighters and trainers, guys who are ex-military and special forces, um, guys who um, work in you know the oil field industry, which is an incredibly tough industry. I mean, I could go on and on and on, you know, who are people that, you know, I mean, you know, they act like guys, you know, I mean, they like the same things everybody else likes, you know. Um, they like, uh, you know, rough housing and, and, uh, you know, looking at beautiful women and, and, uh, you know, drinking fine whiskey and smoking good cigars and all the things that, you know, dudes like, but then at the same time, you can have a real conversation with them right. and you can sit down with them. And there's a time and a place for that. And it's not when you first, you know, when you first introduce yourself to a new group of guys, you know, you shouldn't be burying your soul because number one, you don't know if those guys are even worth you burying your soul to but the second thing is, you know, it's just it's just kind of just too much. It's inappropriate, you know. Um, it it, it uh, for a lot of guys, it's going to show a neediness that you know that that's going to turn them off. Because you know, if there's one thing that you know most men hate, it's you know people, somebody who's needy. And you know, to be frank, I mean, no woman wants to be with a needy guy either. No woman wants to be with a needy, weepy guy. No matter how much they say, you know, they watch rom coms and and whatnot, and they say that you know they love, uh, you know, oh gosh, man, I'm trying to think of the guy. Paul Rudd, who's hilarious, right? No matter how much women say they want to date Paul Rudd, they really don't. They want to date Jason Statham. <laughs> it's the truth, you know? You don't see Jason Statham breaking down and crying and crap like that, you know? I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't picture him doing it, you know? There's nothing in what, you know, my in my mind, what I think of Jason Statham being that, that would ever, you know, that it could ever see him, you know, like, uh, you know, sitting around you know, in a book club, you know, an Oprah book club, uh, you know, crying about reading, you know, the help. Right. It's just, it's just not going to happen. So. Yeah. And what came to mind as you were saying that was that men don't want to meet a guy that's needy and like all emotional and stuff because to them, it kind of, they, they tell themselves maybe on a subconscious level, uh, that this guy is probably not going to be able to get my back, you know, yeah, exactly. and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, or, you know, um, not only is he going to be able to get my back, but that I can trust him to have my back. Right. You know? It's the same thing with guys that, uh, you know, um, snipe other dudes' women. Mm -hmm. You know, no, no, no guy wants to be around a dude that's going to constantly be sniping the other guy's women. You know, that doesn't have a sense of boundaries right. about things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's the same thing, you know. It, 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 a lot of it has to do with mutual respect. But, uh, it, you know, <laughs> a lot of it has to do with self-respect, too. You know, is this guy self-respecting enough to stand up when he needs to stand up? Because that tells me that I can rely on him. And that's important. Um, you know, I think that's also why uh, a lot of guys, you know, that are, you know, in elite military units that go to war and so forth, they develop some strong bonds with their, their fellow soldiers is simply because, you know, you're going through hardship. And anytime you go through shared hardship with other men, there are going to be strong bonds there. And they're not bonds that have to be discussed or talked about, but they're there because it, 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 it goes back to just knowing, you know, we went through hell and I know this dude has my back. Right. You know? That seems to definitely be a key component when it comes to to relationships between men. It's this practical mm. uh, that and it's funny, like it's really different, you know, with men than it is with women. I mean it really is, because you don't put that kind of standard on women when you're with them. Like, you know, uh, I have a girlfriend right now and <clears throat> I would never expect her to have my back in a confrontation you know i wouldn't i would not even dump her if she runs away and you know calls the cops or something if i'm mm -hmm. in a fight i wouldn't i probably wouldn't be that mad about it but if a guy did that it definitely would put a different uh you know tone to the relationship yeah doesn't say that i don't want to date a woman who like you know like you know like i wouldn't want to date a woman who's a black belt crop guy brazilian jiu-jitsu or you know filipino martial art instructor who are like you know, if I got into a confrontation with like, it was like three against one, the, you know, that she'd be sneaking around the backside and, you know, beating somebody over the head with a brick or something like that. You know? <laughs> yeah. Like, oh yeah, that's my kind of woman. Nothing wrong with you that. Know? Yeah. <laughs> I, and, and that's the thing too, is, you know, when I write my fiction novels, I try to write uh, female characters that don't need to be saved because, you know, I think there's something to that. I think especially in today's society that, that, you know, women need to, you know, need to be able to, to physically take care of themselves. And that's a discussion for you know, another right. podcast, but 
but I see what you're saying because you know you don't have those expectations of, of women because it's simply not something that you expect from them you know as a man you expect that from other men yeah like could you imagine Jason Statham you know, uh, yelling at yelling at his girlfriend for not getting his back in a fight. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's yeah. not gonna happen. I, I don't think that would really play well in the theaters either, would it? You exactly. know. It's, Although it's in today's like, climate, I might be surprised. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of borderline abuse, really. Right. Yeah, it, you know. And the thing is, um, you know, I, I really the, here's the thing: I don't really have a problem with uh, feminism per se. It's really the modern interpretation of feminism that that right. is. Has been so harmful to uh, to men, masculinity, and manhood in Western society. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, we live in a society that's way too comfortable. You know, um, I mean, you know, we don't have to worry about anything. You know, they're really you don't have to really deal with um, serious physical threats in the way of um, you know, food, fire, clothing, shelter, or um, you know, somebody attacking you. You know, uh, murder. On a daily basis, and I think the further that societies get away from um, everyday subsistence and everyday in in everyday existence, you know, kind of uh, um, having to worry about their subsistence and existence and safety every day, I think it gives people a lot of time to come up with some crazy bullshit. Definitely, you know? and, and that's what we're seeing in society today. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm like you know, I am totally all for. Women being strong, women being equal, women getting equal pay, women getting equal opportunity. I, I want that, you know. I mean, that's, you know, I, that's just, it's only fair. Right. Um, but it's only, um, the only time I have, the only thing is I really have issues with is the attacks on men and manhood and, you know, making everything that is masculine um, automatically an insult. Right. You know, turning, turning masculine attributes into, into uh, undesirable uh, traits. Yeah, so. and I would add to that by because I've been doing a ton of research on this uh, recently. I would add that, uh, you know, when what modern day feminism? Because I also agree that like when when feminism first came out, I guess some of it was necessary in terms of you know allowing women equal opportunity and stuff like that. Because we don't want an enslaved population, but mm -hmm. uh, but modern day feminism, I feel like it's really. Tr pushing towards uh, making women uh, less and less feminine and men less and less masculine until we kind of come to this androgyny. Like, exactly. And I feel like yeah. that's extremely destructive in so many ways. And not only in – it just messes up with common sense. It uh, doesn't take into account biology. And it also – imagine all the sex lives ruined. I mean mm -hmm. imagine all the couples that like – because a, a big part of like having, I, I believe, and based off research I've been doing, um, a big part of having a good relationship and sex life and stuff, which is a big part of human re relationships, if you take mm -hmm. that into account, a big part of that is having this polarity, having this masculine play of energy and feminine play of energy. And if you take that out and you replace it with two human beings that aren't mm -hmm. masculine or feminine, it's kind of like making love to to a mirror image of yourself. It's just weird, you know. And yeah, and you know, even you know, because I I've had several friends. I have several friends who are uh, who are homosexual, and you know, you even see it in in uh, people in the LBGT world, yeah. their relationships, because there's usually one person that ends up being more dominant than the other person in the relationship. So you know, I think it's only natural. I think it's just nature that that uh, that you're going to see that you're going to see that interplay of of you know one person playing the uh, the kind of the male role and one person playing kind of the female role, and I don't want to. Um, you know, I don't want to, uh, I guess you say, talk about that too much because I'm not an expert in, in, in those relationships, but I think it's just natural. Um, as far as masculinity goes, I mean, it's pretty obvious to anyone who has half a brain and who is um, not trying to push an agenda that men and women are, are different. Uh, my background is in uh, health and medicine. My degree is in online health. My undergraduate degree is in online health. And uh, physiologically speaking, anatomically speaking, you know, men and women are incredibly different. Our bodies are different. You know, we're we're typically, and I'm talking about the mean or the median. I'm not talking about outliers because they're always outliers uh, between the sexes. But um, you know, we're we're capable of different things physically. We're designed for different things physically, um, and uh, you know, the, the, we are you know psychologically different. Right. So, I think to deny those differences, those those natural uh, God-given differences 
is to deny reality, to deny truth. And, uh, you know, I think you see a lot of that nowadays in the, in the multigenderism, right. that type of movement, um, the gender identity movement. <clears throat> right. Uh, you know, in, it, it, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. It really I mean, is. it really is. Isn't it? I mean, no wonder young people are, are so confused. And no wonder they're so conflicted about so many different things because they're being told that you can be anything that you identify with. Right. You know, I even saw something the other day where somebody was identifying as a cat. What? They say, you know, I'm, yeah, it was the weirdest thing. I don't know. It could have been fake news. You know how the Internet is these days. But <clears throat> that's just kind of the level of bizarreness it's come to. And while it's a free country and I believe in personal freedom – and I think that uh, people should be able to live any way they want. Um, I think if you have two consenting adults, that if they want to get married and they want to live in a marriage relationship, you know, I, I have no right to tell them not to or that they can't or to try to pass laws that tell them that they can't live the way that they want to live. You know, that's what free will is all about. Um, but on the other hand, trying to enforce, you know, your own particular beliefs about gender and identity and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, double standard equality type of, uh, of philosophy on people just because you got a, you know, you got a bone to pick that you have a beef with, with, uh, you know, with a particular gender or with traditional marriage or what have you, you know, I think it's wrong. It's just as wrong as, uh, as, you know, somebody using their religion to try to tell someone that they can't, you know, that they can't, uh, you know, two consenting adults can't be in a marriage relationship together. So. Yeah, and I would definitely add to that by saying I also agree that <clears throat> if you want to, you know, be like – if you want to identify as whatever, fine. But the thing is the problem lies in it becoming this normal state of affairs in our t in today's society. Like uh, Caitlyn Jenner getting the freaking Woman of the Year Award or whatever and getting an honor trophy from like ESPN. Yeah, That's, there was uh, one of the men's magazines, it was either Men's Health or Men's Fitness, when they did their Man of the Year awards recently, um, one of, the, uh, one of the, the people that they chose for a Man of the Year was actually a, uh, a woman, a female, who um, was, uh, she was undergoing gender reassignment, but um, oh you know, basically hormonal. She had, she had only gone to the point where, where she had taken hormones, but uh, hadn't yet uh, done gender reassignment surgery. You know... It's, it's, yeah, it's a crazy mixed up world. It's so weird. Um, yeah. But you know, the thing is, and, and here's, here's my take on it. Yeah. Um, that person who won that man of the year award or whatever, you know, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't have any right, nor do I have the inclination to go to that person and tell them that, that they're, uh, that, you know, basically they can't live that way, that they can't live the way they want to live. I have no inclination, no right to do that. <clears throat> Nor do I have, do you have the right or inclination to take away from their happiness, their personal happiness? You know, if they, if they, if they feel like that, that, uh, that pursuit is going to make them happy, then they have the right to pursue that. And I don't have any, you know, inclination to stand in their way. Moreover, it doesn't affect me personally in my personal life. You know, I think many times, um, people in the men's movement and the, you know, kind of that you see out there that are talking about masculinity and talking about the attack on, on manhood and so forth. I think many times they make themselves victims in a sense, because they take that upon themselves. Nobody can make you feel anything. Nobody can, as I said before, people can't take away your sense of personal honor. It's the one thing they can't take away. Nobody can make you feel anything. Um, you know, less of yourself or less of a man or whatever, unless you allow them to do that. It's a personal choice and it's a personal decision. Right. So I don't have to feel any less of a man because somebody decides to go through gender reassignment. It, you know, it doesn't affect me in the slightest. And, you know, so I honestly, I'm like, fine. Yeah. You know, it's their life. Let them live it the way they want to live. Yeah. I, to I totally agree. Like if, if you're, if we have no right to, to say, go in and tell somebody, how to live their lives and enforce it on them per se. But the the only point I guess I was trying to make earlier was like, but if you start, you know, pre, uh, putting it on media everywhere and then all these little kids see it, like you were saying, they grow up confused and they're like, what the hell's going on? So yeah, that's the that's an, that's an issue that, you know, that, uh, I think parents have to deal with, you know, um, that, uh, you know, it, it also goes back, you know, and we're talking about uh, subjects and topics that are way off what we were going to talk about, but yeah. it goes back to parental rights and so forth and, and, uh, you know, what rights parents have to, you know, to basically define the uh, moral, philosophical, ethical trajectory of their children. So that's something that I think you're going to see a, a lot more of, uh, 
of conflict, and you know that's going to become a battleground, uh, you know, for the for the minds and the hearts of of Americans in in the future. So yeah, it's something to it's definitely something to consider. Yeah, I guess what this all kind of sums up in a sense is that the brain is extremely changeable, and if not, you know, if, if, you got to take extreme responsibility, I guess, over what's going on in your brain and in your children's brain, mm-hmm. because if you don't, there's so much things that can go wrong and. I guess this is a lot of what we were talking about is like, you know, due to certain circumstances, uh, we grew up with certain problems and then now we have to kind of work hard towards reinstilling certain values and virtues and it's all at the end of the day because how changeable the brain is, you know, it's, we're not born knowing it all. We have to learn these things and that's why I'm here, you know, contacting you and trying to learn because I know for a fact that you're someone that understands those kind of values you know i've seen your videos i've seen the content you put out and the fact that you chose to mix martial arts with your business obviously shows that you're kind of on that on that wavelength and yeah so uh, i really appreciate the talk um yeah absolutely i'll i'll end it and then we'll I'll have like a chat with you for a, a minute after this i'll edit it out okay sounds good um so yeah guys uh, i hope you really enjoyed this i hope that uh you got some value out of it and uh for any of you that are interested in learning about marketing and if any of you are doing martial arts and you want to tell your instructor or the school owner uh, where you're at about Mike Massey. He does do a lot of great, uh, he has a lot of great uh, material on marketing martial arts schools. You can let them know. And if you own a martial arts school, uh, check out his stuff for sure. Yeah, they can, uh, and by the way, they can find me at martialartsbusinessdaily.com. Yeah, and you have any other places, uh, or you, you also have a bunch of books on Amazon they could check out, right? Just yeah. Yeah, Mike Massey, M-A-S-S-I-E. And uh, just go Google me on Amazon.com and you'll see a bunch of my books on there. So, Awesome. All right, guys. Uh, hope, you take, uh, hope you guys have an amazing week and uh, I'll talk to you guys later.